All right, well, welcome back to Sound Off Sports. Right now, I am joined by a legend. He's going to be here in Las Vegas this Saturday at One of Us Comics, a brand new spot for their grand opening celebration. He's going to be here Saturday for a meet and greet. You know him. You love him. It's Butch Patrick from the Munsters. Yes, Eddie Munster himself. Let me start with you with this one, uh, Butch, because when I went back, I was watching some of the episodes. Of course, I grew up watching the show. Everybody watched the Munsters as a kid. Here's what I can't believe. Such an iconic show, but when I went back and did some research, there's only two seasons of the Munsters. How is that possible? Well, um, a couple things. Number one, back in the mid-60s, it was not uncommon for shows to run two or three years. Uh, very popular shows at that. Gilligan's Island, Lost in Space, Star Trek, uh, The Honeymooners, you know, 32 episodes or something like or something similar. So we did so many episodes a year back then that uh, they would get a pretty good package together for syndication, even though syndication wasn't the norm. The powers that be at the studios were hoping to get 100 episodes, and most two- to three-year shows got into that into that arena, you know, into the realm of a syndication package. In our case, the Leave it the Beaver Peaver, uh, the Leave it the Beaver people did the Munsters, and although the Beaver went six years, we only went, um, let me see, two years, and then we did a movie afterwards, which kind of gave us uh, enough, uh, enough of a oomph to go to go on. And, and Fred and Al were from New York, and the ratings were suffering a little bit, so a combination of several things led us to only do two years. Yeah, so that's fascinating because you know it is one of those iconic shows, but it did catch steam and become more popular later on. So why do you think it resonated with the public so much after the fact? Well, number one, it was entertaining. It was funny. It was very different. It was one of a kind. So, you know, whether or not you enjoyed monsters, you know, you would watch the show. If you enjoyed comedy, you'd watch the show. It was a sitcom and it was family based and had good family values. Um, some interesting special effects. It, you know, it had a lot of little hooks going on in it, but mainly it was well written and it was well produced, and they, and we had a good cast. Yeah, you know, really a, a remarkable cast. Of course, Fred Gwynn as Herman Munster. You have uh, Grandpa Al Lewis, who was just hysterical. But you know, of course, a lot of the shows about Marilyn, and I didn't even realize this going back to watch some episodes and do some research. There was actually two. Marilyn's. You had Beverly Owen, and then you also had Pat Priest, who did a bunch of episodes. So very fascinating. There was a change. What was the deal with that? Why did we go from Beverly Owen to Pat Priest? She uh, went out to do a pilot, and she was a New Yorker. She was in love, and her agent pretty much uh, crossed her up and told her, you'd only be there for a week, go out for the paycheck and the credit, and you'll be home. And what happened was she uh, landed on a hit series and was stuck out there. And she was very unhappy. So, oh, my God. Yeah, after 13 weeks, Fred and Al uh, went to the producers and they said, you know, you got to let this girl go home. This is like almost like harsh and unusual punishment to her. And they said, no way. She's an integral part of the show. We're not letting her go. And Fred and Al being the New Yorkers, and they go, well, we'll make you an offer that you can't refuse, so to speak. You either let her go or we'll quit and you won't have a show at all. So make arrangements to bring in a new blonde. And that's what happened. Wow. Yeah, you know, it's crazy because I went back and watched some episodes. And, you know, listen, I I mean, let's just be real. Beverly Owen was smoking hot. And I read somewhere that you actually had a crush on her with taping. Uh, So just tell me, what was it like just being in the orbit of of Beverly Owen when you're a young boy going through puberty? It must have been crazy. Well, you know, you got to remember, I'm, you know, turning, I'm 11 years old. I started when I was 10. We went on the air. I had turned 11. And, uh, you know, little little boys around that age are have crushes. I had a crush on my fifth grade teacher. Right. But, Be- but Beverly <laughs> Owen um, was 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 quite the dish. And she was very sweet and very kind. And I just was enamored with her. I had a, I had a very big crush on her, no doubt. Um, not that Pat Priest wasn't wonderful, but for, for some reason, uh, I was a little smitten by Pat, by Beverly. Yeah, you know, it's not that, you know, Pat Priest, I mean, beautiful woman, but Beverly Owen just had more of a youthful look, and I think it played well. And she, I mean, she was just striking, but it played well with the whole cousin dynamic. But, you know, what's really truly genius is just the concept of Cousin Marilyn being considered grotesque by the Munster family. Like, you know, drop that gorgeous to everybody else, but within the family, the Munster family, they just think she's... uh, you know, grotesque, that concept, brilliant. Tell me what you think about that and how big of a role that really 
how that functioned within the storytelling of the show. It was, and you know, and people that are you know really really big fans of the show may or may not notice this, but the show shifted, in my opinion, quite dramatically when Beverly left the show. The original thirteen episodes, the premise was much more about. Marilyn Munster in the foreground, in the forefront, I should say, and the family being behind the scenes. And the whole storyline was always about Beverly trying to find love. Yeah. And her boyfriend's boyfriend's coming to the front door, her dates, I should say, and (laughs) see the family, they run away and panic. She goes, oh, Uncle Herman, what's wrong with me? And then they go like, oh, no, no, they're there, dear. And then when Pat came on the show, it, it became a little bit more about Herman and Lily and Grandpa and Eddie. Maryland became a little bit more of a sidebar. Yeah, I mean, it, it, listen, in today's age, I mean, just to be truthful here, um, the first 15 episodes, it's basically like a dude's, the storyline is, you know, a dude's trying to bang Marilyn and he's got to go home and meet, you know, Herman Munster. It was, and it was, and, it was, and Pat, well, you know, Pat was great, but Pat will be the first one to tell you that, you know, she didn't get as much dialogue as she would have liked. And uh, another thing happened too was the Eddie character, um, a lot of times, except for like the Leave It to Beaver was groundbreaking. And it was really the first sitcom that featured the kids as the stars and the family unit as the secondaries, as a, as a supporting role. And what happened with Fred and I, they started noticing that we had a chemistry and the father and son shows starting started to rear their head where I would volunteer my dad for something. He would not want to disappoint. He would go out. We would have these father and son uh, moments. And it, it evolved into several shows that featured um, Eddie and Herman, which was really great for me because a lot of times kids become the second Marilyn situation. You know, they're not quite centerpiece. You know, Butch, tell me kind of from the beginning here because what I read is that you were noticed from an audition that your sister was actually in fact on. And is, is that how it went? She was out for an acting audition and then you somehow got noticed. Is that correct? Right. It, what it was is she was three years old. She was just going up for a photography shoot to supply the agent with some photos for some, they were looking to do from print modeling. And there was a gentleman named Amos Carr, who was the go-to child photographer at the time in Hollywood studio in Hollywood Boulevard. And all the working kids had Amos Carr um, comp- composites. So when he was done with my sister, he looked over at me and he goes, you know, I kind of like the look of Butch. Do you mind if I put this hat on him and, you know, take a, po- a few photos for my files? And my mom goes, no, no, not at all. So he took a picture, he put it in the window of his studio, and a couple weeks later, a producer and a director were walking by, and they were in the midst of casting a movie, still hadn't found the youngest uh, son of Jane Wyatt and Eddie Albert, and the younger brother of Brenda Lee for a little 20th Century Fox movie. So they inquired, and he said, well, he's not in an actor, he was just in the, you know, in my uh, studio. And they go, well, do you know how to get in touch with him? And he goes, oh, yeah, of course, I can give you her agent's number, and through her, you know, through her, you'll find him. And, one thing led to another. They 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 tracked me down, and I went on an interview, and got uh, got the movie. You know, no no experience necessary, and that's how my career started. Yeah, you know, I'm super curious because you know, take me back. I mean, what was it like being 10, 11, You know, a, a child actor on in the '60s on a CBS sitcom. That must have been super tough. A lot of pressure memorizing those lines, balancing school and work. And, you know, today, obviously, you know, the standards for a child actor are completely different. But what was it like being in the 60s? You know, you're on a sitcom set. You got to memorize all these lines. You're 10, 11. What was it like? How Wasn't it a lot of pressure? It can be. And well, it really wasn't for me. For some reason, I was always a little um, older for my years. I, I In Hollywood, I was the perfect, I was the perfect uh, set up. I was uh, mentally older and physically younger. So when I was eight, 11 and 12, I was playing eight or nine, but mentally they used to call me a 39 year old midget because I was so <laughs> old. They go, there's no way that's an 11 year old kid over there. So um, no, it never intimidated me. And I was always a regular kid who just sort of stumbled into a uh, surreal world of making movies and going behind the studio gates. But as soon as I came back out onto the street, uh, all I wanted to do was play Little League and throw a frisbee and ride a minibike and be a regular kid. And I lived an hour away from the studio, so I had a very big buffer zone between studio life and my normal life. But Okay, so what about you? Because, I, I mean, imagine it, it must be interesting. You know, you're a celebrity. You're an icon. You go to the school. Everybody's like, wait, isn't that Butch Patrick? Isn't that Eddie Munster? I mean, it must have been tough, or or you must have been the most popular kid in school and you're in geometry class and people are like wait that's that's eddie munster 
how did that work? What was it like being that famous as a young kid, but you're in school? Popular, it, it could be a good popular and there could be a bad popular. Um, kids, by nature, are kind of not cruel, that's a little bit harsh, but they're inquisitive and they like to make fun of. And if you are something different or if you're a celebrity, you're going to be in, you know, you should have thick skin because you are going to be targeted. Let's put it that way. Uh, out of curiosity, if nothing else, my problem when I went back into junior high school after the Munsters ended, everybody knew who I was. I was in a very big school, 3,500 students. And um, I created a problem for the staff because the kids wouldn't want to go back to class after nutrition because they were all like, you know, hanging around, uh, put, you know, looking at me and, you know, making fun of me or whatever they wanted to do. So the solution that the, the, the school had was to, uh, throw me out of school and they did it oh. twice but the third time around i said you know i don't want to go to a private school mom and she goes well then you're just going to have to figure out a way to make this work and we did we had a little assembly and everybody they had a formal introduction to the school so instead of individual people doing all this we just decided you know let's let everybody know about it all at once and that's kind yeah. of how it worked it's a but shame now, it, it's a shame you know i feel for you because it's like at one side of the coin it's like what a privilege and what an honor to be that talented as a youngster to to be in that situation and be an icon. But then it's also you can't have the childhood kind of thing. Well, I got to tell you, it, it worked OK for me because I got through it very, very quickly. Uh, immediately, a couple of ninth graders came to my rescue and kind of befriended me. So I was I had my little protection unit going on. But mostly I put myself in their position. Had I been the regular kid and another kid came in, I probably would have been doing the same thing. So I never really took it personal and I never let it I'll get to me and I never got mad about it. And, you know, it was just more of a part that goes with sort of goes with the territory. It's like, you know, when you become uh, famous or whatever you're on, if you're in a situation, that's part of the deal. And if you don't like doing it, don't do it, I guess. But yeah. as a kid, you don't really make that choice. You just kind of went to work and then the monsters took off like a rocket. Okay, real quickly, a couple last things I just want to ask you. Uh, one thing in particular, my mom wanted to make sure I asked you, and it I'm is big, funny. I'm big with moms. Moms love you. But I got to ask you about this hairline because, it, you know, it is a striking situation, this whole hairline with the werewolf. Tell me, what's the story behind the hairline? Well, we actually went into production without that hairline. And the one scene, you know, one scene made it to to uh, to the TV set. And there's a scene where there's the love potion episode, the first episode, and the neighbor falls in love with Herman and uh, and it was it was meant for Marilyn and she didn't have the oatmeal. So she went to school without it. Everybody else ate the oatmeal and everybody started falling in love with them. So there's a scene of me running down from, running home from school with a bunch of girls chasing me. And if you look really closely, you'll see I don't have a widow's peak. So what they did in the dailies, they go, he's not believable as the offspring of Herman and Lily. He looks too normal. The pointy ears just aren't cutting it. So Mike Westmore, who, by the way, is the, one of the most famous and you know greatest makeup people in history, he was my uh, my makeup man. I was his first ward as an apprentice for, for uh, uncle, underneath Uncle Bud Westmore. So Mike took it upon himself to put on a widow's peak and put on dark eyebrows, and he also created the Wolf Wolf doll at the same time to give me this statement type of thing going on. And that's that was... how the that's how the widow's peak came to be. Yeah, that was. That was genius. Same thing with the whole doll. Because listen, every kid, right, has an action figure, a doll, something like that. So it really was a, a smart move there. But okay, a couple last things I got to ask you. So I'm curious, is there an Adams Family without the Munsters? Because, uh, you know, the Adams Family came along much later, right? No, we were on the same two years. Uh, really? What happened was, is the Adams Family... Yeah, they were off. They actually came on the Friday before. We were on the Thursday the 24th. I think they came on Friday the 18th. But we ran seven more episodes than they did. But what happened was is they were a uh, you know a comic strip, the New Yorker, the Charles Adams, very dark humor comic strip. The Munsters had actually been on the drawing board since 1955 when Bob Clampett, the animator, wanted to do a cartoon version of the Munsters, friendly universal monsters in a friendly environment. That never caught up. And then after Leave it to Beaver went off the air, Conley and Mosier were looking for something to do. And the reason they did it was because Universal Studios, you know, had this monster thing down to a T. I mean, they did the greatest monster movies of all time. And they had the sets and they had the techniques and they had the style and they had the lighting. So everything that they utilized from the monster movie genre, they applied, except they inserted Leave it to Beaver family value scripts. All right, gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like... Um... 
if you have a tomato sauce factory, you might as well open up a pizza shop. Right, and then the Adams Family caught wind of that. The people at ABC caught wind of what was up, and then they threw together the Adams Family to sort of not not ride the coattails, but to be competitive. They were looking for stuff to do, and it worked out really well for both of us because, you know, we weren't up head to head, so it wasn't like one or the other. But the fact that they were both on the air simultaneously, sort of, you know, you preferred one, but you watched them both. Well, it's the great Butch Patrick. We thank you so much for being a part of this. You're going to be down here in Las Vegas, downtown Las Vegas, at one of us comics and toys for the grand opening. It's a great opportunity to do a meet and greet with you, Butch. Um, snap that pic, do all that great stuff. And I see there in the background, you got the Beatles poster. I know you're also a, a great musician as well. You got to tell us, I mean, who is the best Beatle of all time? Who's Eddie Munster's favorite Beatle? Well, at the time, you know, I think, you know, Paul was everybody's favorite Beatle, but over the years, George has become my favorite Beatle. I was very good friends with his older sister, Louise Harrison, for over 20 years before she passed. And I, I really got to know George and, you know, he was sort of shut out by the Beatles. And as soon as, as soon as they broke up, you know, he came out with all things must pass. He had such right. a huge catalog and he did the Bangladesh. He was so far ahead of his time and doing such great work and so spiritual that, yeah, George is my favorite. That's interesting. And you know what? If you know your Beatles history, truly, you know, George was the kid of the Beatles. He was far younger than all the other Beatles. He yeah. was kind of like the Eddie Munster yeah. like, of the Beatles. You're hanging out with Fred Gwynn, all that kind of stuff. He's hanging out with these older guys. He was a much younger guy when he joined the Beatles. Well, every time I drive through Benson, you know, in Illinois, they have the George on the side of the highway thing because that's where Louise's first house was when he came over at 16 years old, I think. And visited her, um, and they actually had a bed and breakfast called The Hard Day's Night there. So, yeah, that was over the years. Beatles were amazing, wonderful. That, talk about a short run with longevity. <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank the great Butch Patrick. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you come see him Saturday. One of Us Comics, downtown Las Vegas for their grand opening. Great opportunity for a meet and greet. Snap that pic with Butch Patrick, and thank you, Butch, just for keeping this iconic show alive. Even if you go to Munsters.com, it says presented by Butch Patrick. So you're keeping around this icon for us, and uh, we appreciate that. Thank you, Mike.